Hey everybody, welcome back. Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. Uh, we have moved a mile or two north and east from the Harper House, and now we're on the battlefield proper. And let me just summarize, I'm gonna say it right off the bat. We are in the middle of this, <laughs> okay? So this is confusing stuff. The first day of the Battle of Bentonville, I will put it up there for difficulty in understanding all of the uh, dealings and movements of it up there with any other battle. It's complex stuff. I'm going to do my best to, uh, you know, uh, maybe outline it simply. This is why I'm using my slow voice right now, because if I get excited, I'll skip everything. So here we are. It's the first day of the battle. Um, Sherman has 60,000 soldiers. Uh, Johnston has uh, coming up on 22,000 soldiers. This is all he can mu uh, muster, and it is a miracle he's gotten this many together. The key here is that Sherman doesn't have 60,000 or 30,000 or 25,000 soldiers here yet. He's got far fewer. In fact, Sherman and Slocum both believe that all that is in front of Henry Warner Slocum, remember again, Slocum's coming up this way, Howard is coming up that way. They each command half of Sherman's army groups, okay, um, or, or in total. Uh, Sherman and Slocum both think that all that's in front of Slocum is DeBrell's cavalry or maybe some of Hampton's soldiers which have, have already skirmished with some of the Union. Brush them aside and clear the road. What road? This road off to the right, the Goldsboro Road, now known as the Old Goldsboro Road. So Slocum's going to come up here, clear the road, and continue on and make his juncture um, with, uh, with uh, Oliver Otis Howard. We got some good Gettysburg guys here back together again. Of course, really, they're performing so well in the West. Um, I would really consider them doing their best work in the West, including here at the Battle of Bentonville. The advanced division here um, under Carlin is going to run into a little bit more than just DeBell's cavalry. In fact, the situation really is, is that you've got some of Hoke soldiers uh, astride and especially south of the road over there. Coming over here, you've got 20 Confederate cannons in the middle over there. You've got other Confederates, the North Carolina Junior Reserves. Continuing the line up this way, you're going to have the Army of Tennessee. We are talking about the fearsome Army of Tennessee. Pick your western battle. Stones River, Perryville, Shiloh, Resaca, Kennesaw Mountain, Chickamauga, um, the fight at Chattanooga. Pick it. That's this army. Pick Franklin and Nashville, too, where the Army of Tennessee um, essentially ceased to exist. And by the time they get here, it's 4,500 soldiers or so. That grand army, which might have swelled, I think, at Chickamauga to some 60,000 soldiers, it is now reduced to the size of an average size or a smallish Confederate division. And they are off in that direction, but buttressed by and attached with, you know, some additional forces. Uh, Tolliver's uh, division that we talked about yesterday at the Battle of Averisboro. So imagine the Confederate line looping around this way, all under the command of Johnston. And you can't see it all. It's further away. This is a huge battlefield and one that the uh, state of North Carolina has done a great job with uh, in association, of course, with the American Battlefield Trust. Um, preserving the land and then laying out these interpretive plazas like you see right here. Huge half moon shaped plazas where buses can come in, cars can come in, and increasingly connected by walking trails. Just wait, we've been watching this place go from 600, 1100, 1800, 2000 acres. This is a real deal field. It's a huge battlefield, but here we are in the thick of the most of it, okay? Carlin is moving along the road here and he's going to run into stiff resistance. He sees and notes the Confederates off to his north, the Army of Tennessee and others. And Carlin leaves the road. We're talking about Buell's brigade. I think Miles is in there, Hobart's brigade. And they start moving up through there. There's some difficult ground. Most of this place is super flat, but there's some terrible declivities and swamps over there. And over there, where another Union division is going to come up under Morgan, there's a terrible swamp there. And Morgan recognizes is that he can fortify that swamp. It's not this next tree line you see in the distance, but a very similar looking tree line, tree line beyond it um, is where Morgan is. So in other words, if I can look at the map again, and I'm gonna orient it the way approximately we're facing here, and I know there's a lot going on in this map, but these are Morgan's men, okay? They are facing off against Hoke, okay? You've also got McLaws over there. Okay, so things aren't looking good for Morgan, but he fortifies and he's got this swampy ground in front of him. I've never been in it, and this is probably my 15th time at Bentonville, but I hear it's absolutely impassable and nasty. The Confederates are gonna have a tough time even getting anywhere near, let alone through, it to the Union position. And around this key time, right as the Confederates are gonna begin their attack or so, 
uh, I think it's Braxton Bragg, pulls out Lafayette McLaws to go over and help on the other side of the line, um, really robbing Hoke and the Confederate left of a key and experienced group of soldiers who might have been able to make a difference over there, okay? But none of that is really happening yet, okay? You got Morgan there, you got Carlin over here, you have more Union soldiers coming, and the time is running out for the Confederates to make a difference, to try to destroy the Union Army piecemeal before they come all the way up, okay? And as Carlin's troops, again, Hobart, Buell, think Miles, um, end up over there, they run into um, the, the actual Army of Tennessee. The Army of Tennessee, and, and you can read, by the way, this book, Moore's Historical Guide. There's other books, Mark Bradley's masterful study of the whole Battle of Bentonville. But for my part, if you don't want to engage in a 300-page book, look at this. It's still hard to understand, but he's got maps. He's got step-by-step -step instructions. If you really delve into this, this book will cover Eversboro and Bentonville for you. Uh, my highest compliments for uh, the job that Moore did. And he got help from Mark Bradley, I, uh, the expert or an expert on this battle. As Carlin's guys are moving in there, the Army of Tennessee launches their last grand charge, the last grand charge of the Army of Tennessee ever. 4,500 soldiers. One Union uh, man looked at it and said it was a sad sight. They, they, these are experienced soldiers, but the regimental flags were almost touching, okay? Meaning that these regiments had been reduced to the size of companies, 29 soldiers or so per regiment um, at that point. In other words, you have brigades and divisions the sizes of their old regiments. So this is really the last hurrah, but these are not the skulkers or, or the cowards or anything like that, they are long gone, okay? And in Lee's army and Johnston's army, the people who are still left are the real deal. And they launch this charge, I gotta think, with the rebel yell, and it is successful. They push back Carlin soldiers here, and on their heels they come in, up comes D.H. Hill with additional troops, and the southern troops push everything before them. The Union line is completely wrecked. The uh, reinforcements that come in under, I think, Robinson end up getting pushed back as well and all of a sudden you have the army of tennessee plus other forces bait and tolliver trying to move forward as well this is a big attack here they're going to get in behind um, morgan soldiers so let me make sure i outline this here's morgan facing that way here is hoke um, facing toward him and the army of tennessee comes in and goes like this okay they have almost formed a complete u shape around morgan Morgan, holding tough in front, about faces some of his troops. I think it's uh, some of Van Deaver's troops, or Vandiver, and Fearing comes in, another brigade. I know this is confusing stuff, and launches into the Confederates. The Southern attacks, I mean, they're in the perfect position, but there's poor communications. They are just as disorganized in victory as the, as they, as the Union might have been um, in their defeat. And as they're coming up and pushing in this direction, up comes battery after Union battery and Cogswell's Union brigade here. So imagine Stevens, Vinegar, um, and Rich's batteries, and they are starting to pour um, shell and shot and canister into the Confederate lines here. Bate and Tolliver are held up short, and this is it. It's the Confederate high tide of the Battle of Bentonville right at the beginning of the first day, okay? And these Southerners who pushed in in this grand charge and now go to a, a, a complete disastrous situation because up comes all the, you know, the full might of the Union um, 20th, uh, 14th Corps and the 20th Corps are coming up and there's no way for the Southerners to hold on. Ultimately, what will happen is um, uh, Hill's men, a Alexander P. Stewart's Army of Tennessee, they're going to fall back in that direction. The Union will shore up the line here. They're going to put more than 20 guns over there. On some of the hills, you can actually see them. Thanks, Chris. That's Chris White behind the camera, off in the distance. So you can see they'd have had a perfect shot raking these fields, and they form a strong line here. The Southerners pull back, having lashed out as best as they could, okay? Um, uh, you know, this is only the beginning of the first day of the battle, really, but the Army of Tennessee has already suffered half the Confederate casualties of the entire battle um, of Bentonville. The Union continues to bring more soldiers up, and the Confederates consolidate their lines back there. Before long, Howard is going to arrive. Should Joe Johnston leave at this point? Um, what's he still doing here now that he's going to be facing 40, 50, 60,000 soldiers after lashing out against just a portion of Sherman's army? So we're going to leave that for the next stop. But what I want you to really be left with is the Union comes on the field. They quickly realize they're facing a large force that Johnston was able to put together in part as a result of the Battle of uh, Aversboro um, in the preceding days. And they make their take their best shot 
at destroying a part of the Union Army, hoping to destroy another part afterward. It comes close um, to gaining some real success. It fails. The Union just really lashes back at them, and it was terrible. And I think if I can find it, I'll have just one or two quotes that I want to read from really scribbled notes here. Uh, one Union soldier from Illinois actually said, I remember the day well. It was a um, Sunday. Uh, it was beautiful and sunshiny, and were it not for the uh, terrible rattle of musketry, we would have been just deliberating the beautiful warbles of the birds of the south. From the southern side, um, it was a little bit more direct here. Um, a uh, captain on Hardy's staff said it was the most terrible um, battle I ever imagined, the most fearful scene I ever witnessed in the Civil War. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to Chris for uh, shooting and thanks to everybody here at the state of North Carolina for this great place. We have more to go. Thanks.